In the second half of the Great Patriotic War, the Soviet aviation had total air superiority. Il-2 aircraft, one after another, delivered attacks over the fainting enemy. Throughout the war, attack aircraft obtained such fame and confidence that they turned into a symbol of that war. Rough and powerful are the two words truly characterizing Il-2. It was an unpretentious aircraft capable of doing its job in a winter frost, summer heat, or a breakup season. Infantry loved it. Soldiers exuberated when it was appearing in the sky rushing toward the enemy. Their joy was the best pride and recognition for a battlefield aircraft. The boom in the aviation development was due to the First World War. Aircraft were quickly mastering one military profession after another, obtaining narrow specialization. Reconnaissance and artillery fire spotting were the first aviation tasks. Then fighters and bombers appeared. Soon an attempt was made to support ground forces right at the battlefield. The task was uneasy for its time. To destroy infantry, cavalry and artillery, aircraft had to carry a significant armament. Flying above the battlefield, they were very vulnerable to ground fire and required protection. The first aircraft did not have sufficient power to carry both weapons and armory. At that time nobody really understood the purpose of the battlefield aircraft and how it should look like. The war experience gave only the initial understanding, and although by the end of the war aircraft of this designation formed a separate category, their goals were established as multifunctional. Years after the war, there seemed to be no progress. Long-time stereotypes died hard. Several attempts were made in the Soviet Union to produce an armored aircraft. In 1930, for example, the Central Design Bureau was assigned to make several types of attack aircraft. The state, having combined efforts of different teams into a kind of a kolkhoz of engineers, placed high hopes on it. All was useless. Abilities of those years strongly limited intentions. Since aircraft of direct support was in demand, the most suitable for such a capacity was the R-5 multipurpose biplane of Nikolai Polikarpov. In the 30s, machines of this type were the main battlefield aircraft. With minimum transformation, R-5 could be turned into a close reconnaissance aircraft, light bombers, or attack airplanes. In the attack version, R-5 was equipped with more machine guns put in sets under the wing. And since the heavy and slow biplane could not dive, machine guns were inclined. Firing was performed in a horizontal flight, practically without aiming. Of course, such attack aircraft efficiency was doubtful. Later, an allegedly fast SSS attack aircraft with a high rate of fire and climb was built on the basis of R-5. But this did not really change anything. A new Soviet military doctrine was adopted in 1932. It contemplated breakthrough of the entire enemy's defense. Aviation was assigned one of the main roles. While the enemy's deep rare facilities were supposed to be destroyed by the heavy and long-range bombers, the tactical breakthrough was supposed to be achieved by the frontline aviation. But in practice, it appeared that means and efforts were insufficient. Almost everything went on building an enormous bomber fleet, the main striking force. 
The remaining topics were funded by what was left. Not only this impeded creation of a battlefield aircraft, the concept of the future machine was indistinct. Commanders wanted to have an armored attack aircraft and a reconnaissance spotter in one airplane. Besides, the country had no suitable engine to match the plan. In the meantime, the Soviet delegation went to the United States. Among other things bought in America, there was a license to produce a multi-purpose high-speed Valti V-11 aircraft. This was in 1936. The aircraft was supposed to be used as an attack aircraft. After testing samples brought to the USSR, it became clear that the airplane was almost unfit for military use. With its scarce defense armament and low viability, in case of war the machine would be doomed. The issue of arming Soviet Air Force with a modern aircraft remained open. On December 25, 1936, a conference attended by Stalin took place in Kremlin. The conference assigned construction of a multi-purpose aircraft to three designers. Pavel Suhoy was assigned an all-metal version, Josef Neman a wooden version, and Nikolai Polikarpov a combined layout. Later, all three machines obtained a single code Ivanov. The concept based upon the American Valti did not comply with the military requirements, but the Air Force Command took a passive standpoint. Of all the Ivanov program participants, only Suhoi managed to create a good light bomber SU-2. Though later, instead of old metal as the assignment prescribed, it was issued in a combined layout. Reality made its adjustment. In 1936, the Soviet Union had a chance to test its aircraft in combat condition. A civil war occurred in Spain and the Soviet volunteers went there together with the aircraft. As to direct support aircraft, the very first telegram from Spain said, In result of all previous combat activities, R-5 and SSS aircraft proved their inoperability for attack operations in the modern warfare. Inoperability was established just two weeks after the aircraft entered combat activity. Later, RZ aircraft, representing a significantly refurbished version of R-5, joined the war. Realistically, its capabilities were not much higher. The new SB high-speed bomber was also tested in the war in Spain. It belonged to the frontline bombers category. This aircraft was designed by Andrei Tupolev. His main idea was that the bomber must have enough speed to run away from fighter. Concentrating on this task, Tupolev made lines of the fuselage maximum streamline. Squeezed tight, the pilot, the gunner and the navigator could hardly perform their duty but the bomber could easily escape fighter. The speed for that time was quite high, 400 km per hour. In Spain, SB fought from October 1936. At first, until the enemy received new fighters, SB enjoyed its speed superiority, though a lot of deficiencies emerged. By summer 1937, with the appearance of the Messerschmitt 109 fighters, all SB advantages vanished. Attempts were made to provide them with fighters' protection. But upon seeing the enemy, pilots would switch on full throttle, leaving fighters' protection way behind. The fact that SB did not comply with the frontline bomber requirements was known from the start. Nevertheless, its production continued at several factories. A total of 7,000 machines was built. 
a training version of this aircraft was made, it differed by an additional cabin designated for an instructor. The next proof of the SB in operability happened during the brief war with Finland. The crew members, dressed in winter jackets, were unable to move in their cabins. But there was not much to choose from. The Su-2 frontline bomber was only about to enter service. R-5 could carry bombs, but they were so much outdated that did not have any importance. The Illusions DB-3 bomber appeared in those years was good, but it was a long-range type. Thus, only Tupolev's SB remained in the frontline bomber's niche, based more upon quantity rather than quality. The bomb payload increased from 600 to 1500 kilograms was optimistic. But in this case, some of the bombs were already placed not in the bomb bay, but suspended outside. This significantly reduced the fast bomber's speed. In the course of modernization, SB obtained new engines and armament, but its main deficiency, cabin tightness, remained. No efforts helped, and there was clear understanding that a new aircraft was needed. At that time, among design bureaus, there was an unusual team. Formerly, it was headed by the NKVD, but in fact, all key positions were occupied by convicts, the people's enemy. In this particular design bureau, convict Vladimir Pitlikov made his PE-2 frontline bomber. At first, the aircraft was being made as a high-altitude fighter. It was assumed that enemy bombers could fly high and the high-altitude fighters were supposed to counter them. Reality urged priorities to be changed. For the time being, the aircraft acted both as a fighter and a frontline bomber. But soon it became only the latter. At that time, Air Force paid attention to new tactics, the dive bomb dropping. Such bomb dropping was more precise. The first to implement it were pilots of the U.S. Naval Aviation. Its another important feature was that the diving aircraft was practically invulnerable to air defense. No wonder that the Germans picked up this tactic. In Germany, it reached its peak with the appearance of the Junkers 87 dive aircraft. In the Soviet Union, AR-2 was supposed to become the first dive bomber. This aircraft represented SB's radical modification. Designer Alexander Arkhangelsky tried to bring new life to this machine, making it more streamlined and equipped with more powerful engines. Issued in a small amount, AR-2 had no perspective. Potential of its layout and durability were exhausted. The problem was that exit from diving was a serious test for both the pilot and the machine. The Petlikov's PE-2 was more suitable for such tactics. In result, the latter was chosen for mass production. Preparation for the twin-engine dive bomber tests is over. Its wings will be loaded as if the aircraft is in flight. This aircraft will perform combat maneuvers at which its elements will experience huge impact. That's why Tsagi diligently developed norms of durability, the extent of impact and safety reserves for each element. Force drivers are switched on. Force indicators show the load growth on the aircraft. Engineers watch the tests from a safe distance. 
The load shows its maximum for an aircraft leaving the dive. At such an impact, the layout reveals no signs of destruction. At that time, Nikolai Polikarpov offered his own high-speed dive bomber, SPB. There was a whole story with this aircraft. Initially, it was made as a tank destroyer and was identified as V-1 and then V-2. The customer did not quite understand what he needed. Polikarpov was dubious either, changing the concept several times. Bad luck seemed to pursue the designer at tests. One after another, prototypes crashed and pilots died. Finally, this caused work's termination. Alexander Yakovlev, so far dealing with general aviation, also designed a bomber, the light close-range BB-22. At tests in 1939, the aircraft showed perfect speed characteristics with no bombs or armament. Problems occurred as soon as the aircraft was armed. A more powerful engine did not help and the aircraft failed to reach production. A more successful frontline bomber was built by Andrei Tupolev. The aircraft was called Tu-2. Like Pe-2, it was a dive bomber. It was more powerful and advanced, but as a result more complex in construction, which is not the best quality for a country trying to rearm its entire air force. This predetermined the aircraft's fate. It went in production, but closer to the end of the war. So far, the country was only getting ready for it. The picture would have been incomplete without the story of another, probably the most renowned, Il-2 attack aircraft. Experience obtained by the Soviet volunteers in Spain gave a lot of thoughts. It became clear, for example, that the fighters for a reconnaissance aircraft's efficiency in fighting tanks was very low. The concept of a multi-purpose aircraft became shaky. In December 1937, the military command raised an issue of immediate creation of a special attack aircraft. A month later, the initiative was supported by Sergei Lushin, who was then chief designer of one of the factories and head of the Defense Industry Division. In 1938, he submitted a letter to the country's leadership, proving the necessity to build a new aircraft, an armored attack aircraft, or a flying tank. Moreover, he promised to make it in less than a year. Of course, he did not make it so fast. The whole idea was revolutionary. The armor of the new aircraft was not put on top of the layout as before, it was part of the layout, integrated in its power scheme. The engine, the cabin and other important units were located inside the streamlined armored steel hull. The center wing and the tail were fixed to it. The crew consisted of a pilot and the gunner placed behind him. The aircraft adjustment, mainly due to engine, continued until autumn 1939. Finally, the first 10-minute flight. The engine was overheating and the aircraft was rolling. And again, more adjustments until next spring. Illusion was cursing Mikulin's engines, Mikulin was cursing Illusion's aircraft. This armored vehicle has not a single hole for cooling. How would it work properly, resented an air fitter. But the compromise was found. Radiators were relocated and holes for cooling were made. The expert commission stated huge potential of the aircraft. While such deficiencies as low power-to-weight ratio, insufficient range and excessive tail heaviness seemed quite eliminable. The AM-35 engine was replaced by AM-38, more suitable for the attack aircraft with a significant power increase. As to the tail heaviness, Illusion removed the second crew member and took off part of the armory. 
the aircraft became a one seat. Instead of the gunner, he placed an additional fuel tank. There was no protection from behind, but now the aircraft could pass the tests easily. The gunner's absence will later result in a large amount of losses. But this would be later, with the beginning of the combat action. The Soviet Union entered the war in the middle of its rearmament. Thousands of outdated RP, RZ and SB bombers made the basis of the frontline aviation. Masses of Tupolev machines were taking off on assignment. Aiming equipment was outdated, but the enemy columns were so dense that it was hard to miss. Personnel and light-armored vehicles were attacked with fragmentation and high-explosive bombs. SB crews performed several flights a day, but soon losses became huge. They increased when the Germans started to use fighters to cover their columns. The Germans were advancing. Everything that could fly was thrown against them. Even fighters carried bombs to attack the enemy's columns. The amount of new airplanes was not big. Only 400 Su-2 were built before the war. The aircraft had a tight, neat layout. It could carry a huge bomb load. Besides, it was armed with several machine guns. If an attack was performed by a large group, it was normally efficient. Together, it was easier to counter the enemy. Fighter support at that time was rare. The crews flying Su-2 appreciated it in winter. A comfortable and heated cabin with an excellent view allowed to concentrate on the mission. And there was a lot to perform. Support provision to our forces over the front line, enemy destruction on roads, bombing of airdrop. Almost no time was spent to prepare for the next flight. Just get the assignment and take off. Unfortunately, in the first month of the war, Su-2 bombers were used as attack aircraft and losses among such machines were high. Later, Su-2 were used for reconnaissance and artillery spotting tasks, and they turned out to be ideal for such work. Su-2 production was stopped in 1941. The disastrous situation in which the country found itself urged it to throw all efforts toward making other combat aircraft. PE-2 production was increased. By the end of 1941, this dive bomber was made at four factory. The aircraft quickly joined combat units. In the units, it was called Pawn. One of the main operations, bomb suspension, was rather simple. As compared to SB, the Petrikov's bomber was a step forward. Besides bombs, its powerful defense made a group of PE-2 hard to defeat by the enemy's fighter. For additional rare protection, some aircraft had rockets firing back 
to the attacking German interceptors. Of course, PEs had deficiencies. A not well-chosen wing shape complicated the aircraft's landing. At first, the PE-2 direct use was not mastered. It was made as a dive aircraft, however dive bomb dropping turned out to be a hard task. Everyone knew how efficient the German Junkers 87 was, but there were specifics of its own. It was important not to get hit by the fragments of your own bomb. The Soviet commanders remembered initiative is punishable, and they did not hurry using PE-2 as a dive bomber. Ivan Polbin, commander of one of the PE-2 units, became innovator. In spring 1942, despite prohibition, he mastered the dive bomb dropping tactics. He then passed his experience to the pilots of his unit and of the division he then headed. Hundreds of other air units equipped with PE-2 practiced horizontal flight bombing. The difficult but efficient method became popular by the end of the war, but never turned into a mass practice. PE-2, the main aircraft of the Soviet bombing aviation, sustained many modernizations. It was used as a bomber, a reconnaissance plane, and a fighter. There were even unusual assignments, like dropping leaflets over the occupied territory. Everyone loved PE-2 for its high speed, maneuverability, powerful armament, and viability. This aircraft played an important role in the future victory. PE-2 was worth its popularity. Walker Wolves on tail. Turn right, I don't see them. Is that okay? Okay. That was great. The Tupolev Tu-2 had better characteristics than PE-2, but it was not as popular. It passed combat tests at the Kalinin front in autumn 1942. As compared to PE-2, its bomb's payload was three times higher, the range was bigger and defensive armament more powerful. But the Tu-2 destiny was such that it was not put in production in the first half of the war, while thereafter it was already not much needed. It was more used as a reconnaissance plane from time to time. Massive Tu-2 deliveries to air units started way after the war. The Su-6 and Su-8 attack aircraft were even less successful. SU-6 represented further development of SU-2. SU-8 was a heavier class. This twin-engine aircraft had a very powerful armament. Both aircraft were brought to perfection by the end of the war, when the need for them was no more acute. Starting from 1942, the Soviet aircraft production rate was steadily growing. Help also came from the Allies under the Lend-Lease program. 
That's how the Boston bombers turned up in the Soviet Air Force. It was made by the American Douglas Company. They amounted to over 800 copies in the Soviet Union more than in the US itself. A reliable twin-engine machine gained high reputation among the Soviet pilots. Boston was faster and more maneuverable than PE-2. It could fly on one motor and was more indulgent to insufficient trained pilots. The most renowned and widely used attack aircraft was Il-2, nicknamed the Hunchback. It entered the war in July 1941, while in September five air units of the Moscow Defense Front were all equipped with Il-2. By 1942, thousands of Il-2 were at every front. Such mass use revealed its main deficiency, acquired in the course of its creation. The one-seat aircraft unprotected from behind became an easy kill for the German fighter. We carried out the assignment, but on our way back, we were intercepted by Messerschmitts. One returned out of five. Here, just repair the wounds and replace the screw. It will fly like new. What is that? The Gureyev machine gun. Here is the author. Will party is crafty. Problems will teach. Initially, Illusion thought of a two-seater with a gunner. It's a good aircraft, but it's worth three or four flights. Well, you made at least a couple of dozens of yours, because I crawl like a snake. If I had a gunner on my back, nobody would even dare fighting. Only by autumn 1942 the aircraft became two-seat and the gunner was back. Since then, such machines were dominating. One-seat attack aircraft were soon off the scene. Losses became less. The center of gravity problem was resolved by providing the wing with a slight sweep. The wing of such Il-2 was called the swept wing. As to its armament, Illusion failed to make a flying tank from the beginning. Early Il-2 armament could not be called anti-tank. But the aircraft was efficient in fighting armored vehicles, artillery units, parked airplanes and other low-protected targets. Its armament included, among machine guns, also rockets. Il-2 was sometimes used as a fighter. For example, in Stalingrad, the hunchbacks were intercepting German transport aircraft making deliveries to their encircled army. Armament enforcing works were continuous. The anti tank topic remained actual throughout the entire war. Il 2 with the suspended 37 mm cannons made its debut in summer 1943 at Kursk. Its maneuverability was a bit reduced, however, a cannon of such a caliber was a serious anti-tank weapon. The Il-2 arsenal was then added by special anti-tank armor-piercing bombs. They were of minor caliber, but hitting a tank, they would pierce even a very thick armor. The rockets also became armor-piercing.
Il too mastered all nuances of the frontline battle, even such exotic as smoke screening. A total of 36,000 Il-2 attack aircraft was built during the war, an absolute record. In the second half of the war, there was not a single operation unattended by these aircraft. Big and slow, it was inevitably carrying its deadly cargo. The Germans did not like it when Il-2 were coming. Between the fights, there were minutes for rest. This happy melody was composed by pilot Yemelyanenko, a former student of the Moscow Concert War. What about the enemy? In the course of the war, the German troops supporting aircraft changed a lot. At first there were the outdated but successful Junkers 87 dive bomber. During attacks, they used special demoralizing SIRAMs. The sound of such a screaming, diving Junkers was probably the most vivid impression of the war. The Heinkel 111 bomber found its mass frontline application, while the less popular Junkers 88 was used in various variants from a fighter to a dive bomber. In 1942, there appeared a new Henschel 129 armored attack aircraft. There existed even an armored attack aircraft based on the renowned Focke-Wulf 189 reconnaissance aircraft. In the second half of the war, special attack aircraft modifications of the Focke-Wulf 190 fighters joined the battlefield. The Soviet aviation did not have this kind of variety. The factories were stamping the successful and approved Il-2. However, there were alternative layouts. In 1942, designer Dmitry Tomashevich came up with an interesting idea of fighting tanks. He offered an anti-tank aircraft to be produced in large amounts. The machine was called Pegasus. Its mass production was quite possible since the aircraft was not big, simple and cheap in making. 
neither it required qualified training. The huge fleet of such small aircraft was supposed to fight the enemy tank armies not by skills but by number. Like a real attack aircraft, Pegasus had an armored cabin. It could carry machine guns, cannons and bombs. But it was not made in thousand. Tests showed that the aircraft was not at all easy in control. By the time the aircraft was tested, the Red Army gained superiority and the huge masses of Pegasus was no more needed. Besides, Illusion never stopped improving its Il-2. The variety of his aircraft at the battlefields provided him with a rich combat application statistics. In 1943, Illusion offered new aircraft with better characteristics. Indeed, by that time, aerodynamics, engine production and technologies were far ahead. Situation at the front was not as difficult as before and there was time for experiment. As a result, Illusion proposed two attack aircraft, Il-8 and Il-10. Il-8 was bigger than Il-2 and had more armor. Il-10 was smaller but faster and more maneuverable. Both machines differed from Il-2 by more powerful engines and stronger armament. After tests, Il-10 was preferred and by autumn 1942 it arrived at the front. Combat activities were coming to an end. It was time to draw conclusions. The war logic proved success of the aircraft narrow specialization against the pre-war multifunctionality concept. Frontline bombers also represented a separate category which came to its perfection in the course of the war. However, attack aircraft now separated from the multipurpose class. Their main task was now to counter the enemy's armored vehicles. Il-2 played an important role in gaining a separate status. Such lucky combination of armor and good flight characteristics was probably found only on this particular aircraft. The Il-2 and then the Il-10 attack aircraft application experience produced an enormous impression on the worldwide aviation experts. Some countries conducted works in the same direction but failed to reach comparable results. This doesn't mean that the American or British allies did not have machines of the same designation. They did, but they were mostly made on the basis of already existing fighters and light bombers. Their work was to support infantry at battlefields, hunt tanks and locos attack ground facility. In 1945, as the Il-10 development, Illusion made even a more lighter attack aircraft, Il-16. But this was already too much. Weight reduction worsened armor protection and durability. In 1948, Illusion made a step in a different direction. Il-20 was a reasonable size machine with a very unusual outlook. The crew was placed right over the engine and had an excellent observation ahead and below, though the new attack aircraft did not show any advantages over Il-10. Appearance of jet engines clearly showed their perspective. Therefore, Illusion, while experimenting with Il-20, improved Il-10. Thus, Il-10M appeared in 1951. 
It was impossible to wave piston engines at once. First jet engines were unreliable, weak and fuel hungry. For the start, they were put on experimental samples. One of such aircraft was Il-22. Illusion equipped it with four engines since the thrust was insufficient. This bomber had to take off with the help of powder booster. Tupolev also made an experimental bomber. His Tu-12 was a development of Tu-2 with piston engines replaced by the Jet-1. One of the first jet aircraft to go in production was made by Sergei Ilyushin. It was the Il-28 frontline bomber equipped with VK-1 jet engines made on the basis of the British NIN engine. Il-28 went into service in 1949. The war seemed to have just ended, but how drastically the aircraft characteristics changed. Il-28 has a speed of 900 km per hour and a ceiling of 12,500 meters. It could carry up to three tons of bombs, including nuclear weapons. Its task was to destroy targets in operating and tactical depth. Its powerful defense armament, including 23mm cannons, advanced radio and navigating equipment, optic and radar aiming devices radically differed Il-28 from the aircraft of the previous generation. Mass-produced, Il-28 served throughout almost 25 years. Different modifications were made on its bases. A reconnaissance version, a trainer, a torpedo carrier and an attack aircraft. It was a very reliable aircraft. Bombers were widely exported. They went through notorious events in their career, including Middle East conflicts and the war in Vietnam. In 1962, during the Caribbean crisis, the Soviet Il-28 carrying nuclear weapons were based on Cuba. Nuclear missiles of those years were not much precise, while bombers, which could easily reach the U.S. shore and produce a strike, represented a real threat. In fact, the Americans removed their blockade from Cuba only after the agreement on the Il-28 withdrawal. With this frontline jet bomber passing into service, the Soviet Air Force reached a radically new level. The MiG-15 and MiG-17 jet fighters of the first generation passed into service on the Soviet attack aviation in mid-50s. Of course, the MiGs were less suitable for such work than the eels. The MiGs were twice faster, but they could not carry so many bombs and rockets. They were also far from perfection in terms of combat viability and pilot protection. Frankly, MiG-15 was no attack aircraft. Besides, it was written off from the fighter aviation due to appearance of more advanced machines. In 1953, Illusion offered an armored jet battlefield aircraft. The Il-40 attack aircraft passed tests and was assigned for production. But there came a governmental resolution terminating works on the aircraft due to the Soviet Army equipment with new types of weapons. With the appearance of the atomic bomb, military circles started to think strategically based on intercontinental categories. All efforts were thrown on the development of heavy carriers, long-range bombers and ballistic missiles. Tactical calculations were put to sidelines. Besides, the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev attempted to demilitarize economy. As a result, in 1956, the attack aviation as part of the Soviet Air Force was liquidated. 
However, as it always happens in history, a hasty decision is not always well thought out.